Welcome to episode 73 of Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we continue with the tales of Troy and the story of Chryseis, Apollo, and the Wrath of Achilles. It was early in the 10th year of the war. Ajax had returned from various expeditions along the coast, laden with spoils. The killing of Polydorsus had fanned the hatred between the two nations to greater fury, and now the gods openly took part in the conflict. Hera, Athene, Hermes, Poseidon, Hephaestus sided with the Argives, while Ares and Aphrodite helped the Trojans, so that of this tenth and last year of the siege of Troy, ten times more has been told and sung than of the nine years which went before. For it is at this point that Homer, the prince of poets, begins his tale of the wrath of Achilles and the many misfortunes which the anger of this greatest among their heroes brought upon the Argives. The cause of Achilles' anger was this. When their envoys returned from Troy, the Argive, mindful of the threats of the Trojans, set about preparing for a decisive battle. While they were so engaged, Chryseis, Apollo's priest, whose daughter Achilles had carried off and given to Agamemnon, came into the camp holding the golden staff of peace, twined with the laurel sacred to his god, and offered a rich ransom for the return of his child. He made this request to the Atridae and the entire host, saying, Sons of Atreus, heroes and men of Greece, may the gods of Olympus grant you victory over Troy and a safe homeward journey, if you give honor to Apollo for the far darter, whose priest I am, by returning my beloved daughter to me for the ransom I bring you. The host applauded his words and recommended that reverence be shown the priest and that the treasure he offered be accepted. But Agamemnon, unwilling to lose his fair prize, objected, saying, Do not let me find you near the ships again, old man, either now or in the days to come. Your daughter is my servant and shall remain so. She will sit at the loom in my palace in Argos as long as she lives. Beware of provoking my wrath, and go while you can. Chryseis was filled with fear and obeyed. Silently, he hastened to the shore, but there he lifted his hands to the god he served and prayed to him, Hear me, Apollo, Smithius, you who reign over Chrysa, Cilia, and Tenedos, if ever I have adorned your altar to your liking and brought you offerings carefully chose, avenge me on the Achaeans and loose your darts upon them. So he pleaded aloud, and Apollo heard his prayer. He slung across his shoulder his bow and quiver and filled with clanging arrows and left Olympus, sullen and threatening as night, he sped toward the Argive ships, and when he was near them, dart after dart whirred from his silver bow, and the taut string twanged with an ominous sound. Whoever was struck by the invisible arrow died of the plague, a swift and sudden death. At first he shot only at the mules and dogs at the camp, but soon he aimed at the men as well, until one after another sank to the ground, and the flames of many funeral pyres flared day and night unceasingly. For nine days the plague raged among the Argive hosts. On the tenth, Achilles, whom Hera, the patron goddess of the Achaeans, had so counseled, called an assembly and advised the people to ask a priest, a soothsayer, or one who unravels the meaning of dreams, what sacrifice would avert the wrath of Phoebus Apollo and turn disaster from the camp? Then the wise the seer and the host arose, Calchas, who prophesied from the flight of birds and declared that he was ready to expound the reasons for the anger of the immortal archer, provided Achilles would protect him. Son of Peleus bade him to be of good courage, and Calchas spoke. 
the God is not offended because of a broken vow or neglect of sacrifice. He is angry because Agamemnon's lack of respect for his priest. Nor will he stay his hand from dealing us evil until the girl is returned to her father without ransom and sent back to Crissa with a hundredfold offerings of atonement. This is the only way in which we can win back the favor of the gods. At these words, Agamemnon's blood beat hotly in his veins. His eyes blazed, and he addressed the seer with beetling brows. You prophet of ill omen, you who have yet said anything that prospered me, now you arouse the people against me, claiming the archer has sent us the plague because I refuse to ransom for the daughter of Chryseus. It is true. I should like to keep her in my house, for she is dearer to me than Clytemnestra, the wife of my youth, and her equal in beauty of body and loveliness of face, in wisdom and skill. But rather than see Argive warriors perish, I shall send her back. If I do this, however... I demand a gift in return. When the king had ended, Achilles replied, Great son of Atreus, he said, I do not know what gift you and your greed that you demand of the Argives. We have no longer any great stores of treasures in common. The spoils we took from the cities we conquered were distributed among us long ago, and surely we cannot take from a man what has already been given him. Therefore release the daughter of Chrysus. If Zeus in the days to come accords us the conquest of Troy, we shall make up your loss to you three, no, four times over. Son of Peleus, the king called to him, do not think you can cheat me. Do you fancy I shall do as you say and give up my prize of war while you keep yours? No. If the Argives deny me recompense, I shall fetch myself what I want from one of or another of you, a gift belonging to Ajax or Odysseus or perhaps to you, Achilles. It does not matter to me how angry you may be, but of that we shall speak another time. Now make ready a ship and a hecatomb, but put the fair-skinned daughter of Chryseus aboard, and let one of the princes, the son of Peleus, for all I care, command the ship. The eyes of Achilles grew dark with anger as he answered, O oh, shameless prince, you who think only of your own ease, how can the deny obey one such as you? I, to whom the Trojans did no wrong, followed you to help you avenge Menelaus, your brother. But you forget this and try to take from me the prize I won by my own effort, the prize of the Achaeans allotted to me. City after city I conquered, and yet I never received a share like yours. I always bore the brunt of the struggle, but when it came to dividing the spoils, you carried off the best parts while I returned to the ships, weary of the battle and content with the little I had. But now... I am going home to Phaia. No more shall I increase the toppling stores of your treasure. Very well, if you must, Agamemnon replied. I have brave men enough without you. Besides, you are the one who is always ready to quarrel. But first, I want you to know that I am indeed returning the daughter of Chrysus to her father. But instead, I shall take from your house lovely Briseis, to teach you that I am greater than you and to warn others not to defy me as you have done. Achilles' heart swelled with fury, and he hesitated whether to bear his sword on the instant and slay the son of Atreus or to bridle his rage. But suddenly, invisible to all the rest, Athene stood behind him and revealed herself to him by catching him at the lock of his brown hair. Curb your anger, she whispered. Do not draw your sword, but you may fume with words to your heart's content. If you obey me, I pledge you a threefold gift. When Achilles heard her warning, he thrust the silver hilt of his sword back into the scabbard. 
but to his words he gave free rein. Unworthy son of Atreus, he said, never did you own heart teach you to lay in ambush with the noblest among the Argives, or to fight in the foremost ranks in pitched battle. It is, of course, much easier to steal a prize from one who has dared to oppose you. But I swear to you by this staff that just as surely as it will not put forth green shoots as it did when it branched on a tree, so from this time on you shall not see the son of Peleus in battle. In vain will you look for aid from Hector, the killer of men mows down the Argives row on row. In vain, with bitterness, gnaw at your soul for having denied due honors to the noblest among the Achaeans. So said Achilles, and he threw his staff on the ground and sat down. Aged Nestor tried to reconcile the opponents with calm and gentle words, but to no avail. Finally, Achilles rose from his seat in the assembly and called to the king, Do what you will, only do not imagine that I shall obey you. Never shall I lift my arm against you or another for the sake of this girl. You gave her to me, and you may take her from me. But do not attempt to touch the very least of the other possessions of my house or my ships. If you do, my lance will drip with your blood. The assembly dispersed. Agamemnon had the daughter of Chryseis, and the hecatomb put aboard ship and bade Odysseus take it to its destination. Then the son of Atreus summoned Talthippius and Eurbates, the heralds, and commanded them to fetch him Briseis from the house of Achilles. Unwillingly they went, and only for the fear of their king. When they reached the camp, they found the son of Peleus sitting in front of his house, and he was not happy to see them. Reverence and timidity sealed their lips so that they did not tell him why they had come, but he had already guessed their purpose. Do not be distressed, he said to them. Approach, O heralds of Zeus and of mortals. The fault is not yours, but Agamemnon's. Come, Patroclus, bring the girl and give her over to them. But they shall bear witness to me before gods and men that if, in the days to come, anyone requires my help and it is not given, not I shall have the blame but the son of Atreus. Patroclus, Achilles' friend, led out Briseis, who followed the heralds reluctantly, for she had learned to love her gentle lord. As he sat weeping on the shore, he gazed down into the dark sea and begged Thetis, his mother, to help him. And from the depths of the water he heard her voice. Woe to me, my child, that ever I bore you, so brief is your life to be. And yet you must suffer such insult and sorrow. But I myself shall go to the Thunderer and employ him to give you aid. It cannot be at once, for only yesterday he departed for Oceanus to, for a feast of the devout Ethiopians, and he will not return for twelve days. But on the twelfth day I shall hasten to him and clasp my hands about his knees. Until then, stay near your ships." When Achilles had received this answer from his mother, he left the shore and seated himself in his house in sullen silence. In the meantime, Odysseus had reached Chryseis and given his daughter back to him. Filled with joyful surprise, the priest raised his hands to heaven in thanksgiving and begged Phoebus Apollo to avert the plague he had sent upon the Argives. Instantly, the plague began to abate, and when Odysseus returned to camp, he found that it had ended. And now, the twelfth day dawned since Achilles had withdrawn to his house, and Thetis did not forget her promise. Through the midst of early morning she rose from the sea and went up to Olympus. Here on the loftiest peak of the jagged mountain, aloof from the other gods, she found imperious Zeus, clasping his knees with her left hand and touching his chin with her right in the matter of all suppliants. She said to him, Father, if ever I have served you well with words or with deeds, grant me my prayer. 
Honor my son, whom fate has doomed to die so soon. Agamemnon has offended him, and taken away the prize he himself won as the spoils of war. And so I beg of you, father of all gods, let the Trojans keep winning until the Argives pay my son the honor that is his due. For a long time Zeus was silent, and made not even the slightest motion. But Thetis clung closer to his knees and whispered, now grant my request, or refuse it flatly, to show me that among all the gods you favor me least. So with her wiles and coaxing ways, she beset Zeus until he answered, but his voice betrayed displeasure. It is not well that you beseech me to act counter to the wishes of Hera, who is always against me as it is. Leave quickly before she observes your presence, and let my nod pledge you that I shall do as you have asked. Even as she spoke, Zeus gave a faint token of assent with his eyebrows only. Yet the great mountain of Olympus shook at the sign. Thetis, well pleased, hastened back into the deep waters of the sea. But Hera, who had seen them talking together, went to Zeus and vexed him with reproaches. He, however, replied calmly, Do not think that you can fathom my decisions. Be still and obey my commands. And Hera trembled at the words of her husband, the father of gods and men, and did not venture to gainsay him or further object to the resolve he had taken. And here is where I end my tales for today. But I'll be back with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.